Hello, 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 and welcome to Property Game Changers Live on the Property Game Changers Facebook page. We're celebrating the power of ethical imp- ethical property investing to really change lives. We're debunking the myth that you need a lot of money to get started in property. And as always, we're inspiring each other to believe bigger, to be bolder, and to be game changers for good. My guest today is Gabe Peterson, all the way from Washington in the US of A. And Gabe is a full-time real estate investor, and he hosts two podcasts, The Real Estate Investing Club, and the Pursuing Greatness podcasts. Like many entrepreneurs, Gabe has tried and failed at many different business models before settling on property and really getting started with his first flip in 2014. Since then, he's moved into lots of different types of property investing, including multifamily, um, including multifamily, mobile homes, and RV parks, which we look forward to finding out more about. So grab a cup of coffee and join us as we get to know property game changer, Gabe Gabe Peterson. Hi, Gabe. How are you? Stephanie, thanks for having me on the show. It's my pleasure. I'm so delighted to have you with us. So, Gabe, Let's start at the beginning. Let's go back in time a, a bit uh, until before you started getting it involved in property. You said that you um, you'd done many different businesses before. So take us back to when you first set out to um, make your own path and start up in business. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, I got started in corporate. I was a management consultant for seven years, um, worked at, you know, the big companies, worked at Microsoft, um, Costco. You guys don't have Costco over there, but you have Microsoft. <laughs> um, so T-Mobile, at and you know, all the big ones. Um, I did not like corporate. I, uh, you know, I didn't like having to, you know, be at a specific place every single day, 9 a.m., uh, rain or shine. And I, I wasn't a huge fan of really the the work. I felt it was kind of you know, not really challenging that much. Um, So I knew I wanted to move, you know, do something different. I I didn't know what it was, but I wanted to find a path that was not in corporate. Um, So I did a whole bunch of different things, just testing the waters, figuring out what could work. Um, I launched, shoot, what did I do? I launched e-commerce stores, did affiliate marketing. Um, I had my own agency, did digital marketing for a while. Shoot, what was it? There's a list of them, but <laughs> I went. So I went on down all these different paths, just trying to find, trying to find a way that I could, uh, you know, some some sort of entrepreneurial business that I could use to exit the corporate world. Um, eventually, I landed. I flipped a house. I landed on flipping houses. Um, how did that happen? I bought a house with my with a friend here in Washington State. It was a triplex. Um, I actually don't remember how we first landed on the idea. Um, I, I landed on the idea of uh, real estate itself by reading the the what I call the real estate Bible, the Rich Dad Poor Dad. Yeah. Um, read that, loved everything he was saying. I was like, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I was working at the time, obviously in corporate, and so I had a ten thirty or not a ten thirty one. I had a W two, so I could get a um, you know I could get a loan. Everything worked out, and so I said, all right, I'm going to do it. Um, me and a friend. Oh, we went through brokers. That's how we did it. We uh, we went through brokers um, and just found this triplex that was, uh, you know, pretty beat up. Um, but we ended up buying it and flipping it. And uh, since then, I just, you know, kept on going. Brilliant. So uh, just let us know uh, from UK terms, we might not be familiar with some of the terms. So with a, with a triplex, is that three separate dwellings in under one title? Is that what it is? Uh, yeah, you guys call it a three flat, don't you? Yeah, well, we don't specifically have a name for it. We'd call it uh, either a conversion or a multi-unit block, you know, like a block of flats, or it might be a converted house into a block of flats, but we don't have a name on the number yeah. of flats. <laughs> it's, just, it's just a multifamily. <laughs> yeah, multifamily. Yeah. Okay, great. So you've you bought that, and can you remember the numbers on it? Uh, yeah, so we bought it at 187. Mm-hmm. Um, shoot, I don't remember e- rehab numbers. I think it was around 40. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we sold at something like 350. Wow. Um, 
So yeah, we made some good good number, um, some good money on it. We were, you know, we were kind of helped by. The, I mean, obviously the economy. We bought it in 2014, I think, and you know, yeah. we sold three years later. And so that the entire time, this especially in Seattle, here where I live, the the economy was just going like hockey stick up. So we were helped out. We did. <laughs> we weren't yeah. geniuses, but um, you know, it ended up working out real well in our favor. And I was like, damn, this this works. Um, I kind of wish that we had kept it, but um, yeah. you know, at the time, it was a lot of money, and I was like, you know, I, I got it. I'm gonna sell it. I'm just gonna do it. And so we sold it, and uh, and yeah, haven't looked back. Yeah, yeah, no, I uh, I agree. We we have some multi-unit blocks, as we're calling them, as one of the ones we have has got twelve units, and um, so the cost per unit is is so different as well, and the mm -hmm. income is about the same, and so uh, I really see a lot of value in going down that road. So tell us where you went, where you went after that one, then. Yeah, so. Um... I mean, at the time I was still in corporate, I was still working in corporate and I didn't really, I didn't leave there until just a few years ago. Um, but so I did the, the flip, um, we held that for about three years and then I started doing, uh, I had learned digital marketing from one of the businesses or a couple of the businesses that I tried. So I was pretty good at digital marketing. So I started, um, marketing for leads online. I did uh, Google PPC, um, Facebook ads, stuff like that. And uh, from those leads, you know, I got a few of them under contract. Um, they weren't ones that I wanted to close myself. So I, I did what uh, we call wholesaling. I'm not sure what you guys call it, but I, I had it under contract. And then I assigned the contract to another investor um, for, uh, you know, small fee. Um, so I did that for a bit. And uh, um, let's see, that took us, took us up to a couple of years ago. Um, and so I started buying and then I bought a, a, a rental. Um, and I did a couple flips in between that. Uh, but then I bought a rental. I'm a huge fan of rentals. That's my, um, that's what I think anybody who wants to, you know, kind of escape the, the rat race as they call it. Um, you, you need to have cash flow, um, not piles of cash. And so started buying rentals. And, uh, from there we, I met some other investors who ha were doing mobile home parks. Um, and, you know, they talked to me about it. It made a lot of sense um, because it's more cash flow oriented. Uh, your tenants are going to be there longer, um, et cetera. And so started doing mobile homes. And now we're, we're closing on our first mobile home um, up here next week, actually. Wow, that's a, a big jump. I, I know a little bit about the mobile home parts from listening to the Bigger Pockets podcast, and they, yeah, they yeah, kind yeah. of talk about it quite a bit. But um, that's quite a leap, isn't it, from buying um, single family or yeah, buying individual investment properties and then going to your mobile home parks? Uh, yeah, it's not it's not that big of a leap. I mean, property is property, especially when you're, when you're renting it out to someone, the, the principles are this, essentially the same. Um, the big difference for that I'm noticing is, uh, like rehab, for instance, um, with, with mobile home parks, you're mostly dealing with the infrastructure, um, with the, you know, water, sewer, sewer, um, electrical, stuff like that. And, when you have issues, there is, you know, it can be pretty significant. Um, but so that's, well, for one, that's why you want to get is whatever park you get. If you, if you want to go down this route, the park that you buy, you want it to be on, um, city water, city sewer. You don't want septic and well, because that can be a huge headache for you, especially when you got however many people, a hundred people going into these septic systems. That's a lot of septic to, to go bad. Um, so yeah, yeah, it is a, it's a bit different, but it's, you know, in, a, in my mind, the, the principles are the same. Yeah. And what was it that made you think, yeah, this is, for, this is definitely for me. Um, I like the idea. So, I mean, I, I have rentals and I do, you know, there's a lot of things that can generally go wrong. Um, I mean, I own the, the windows, I own the doors, I own the toilets, I own the, everything in the house um, that is attached to the house. And each one of those things can break. Each one of those things can, you know, be abused by the tenants. Um, and that in turn leads to a lot of maintenance and a lot of calls and, you know, just a lot of headache in general. And with mobile home parks, that is not the case. There's, you know, the tenants own their own, you know, dwelling unit. They, they own the actual house. 
Um, and so they're responsible for their house. What I own is the the infrastructure. I own the land um, and that doesn't break as often. And so there are, there are fewer calls. Um, yeah. and so it's more, more of the passive investment than it is uh, multifamily. I mean, all real estate when you own it and it's generating cash flow is, is passive um, if that's how you want to look at it. But I feel like mobile home parks are a little bit more so. Yeah. And what I'm, what I'm really intrigued by is that you have two podcasts. One is obviously about real estate investing and the other one is more about uh, development. Tell us about what made you start that second podcast. Um, yeah. I'd love to know a little bit more about it. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I started real estate investing club, um, because I, I obviously do real estate investing. And so, uh, I, I was having a blast with that and I love talking to my guests and all that stuff. Um, and I started getting people reaching out that were not in real estate, um, from LinkedIn. Uh, I've got quite a few connections on LinkedIn and a lot of people, you know, they were coaches, they were business owners, um, you know, whatever it was. And, they were reaching out like, can I be on the show? And I'm like, well, you don't do investing. What, why, what would you talk about? <laughs> and so I decided to start another, another podcast, um, and to just kind of be a catch all for everything else. And I really love learning about, um, self, you know, um, personal development, all that stuff. And so I uh, created a podcast called pursuing greatness and we focused on uh, mastering your health business. Um, Man, it's too early. It's four thirty here in uh, in America, so oh, I'm, uh, wow. <laughs> I'm still my brain is still kind of like waking up here. Um, but yeah, there's a tagline. It's called pursuing greatness. It's, it's uh, basically about um, living a good life. Yeah, no, that is phenomenal. And kudos to you for making it on at four thirty a.m. I'm I'm so <laughs> impressed. I hadn't realized it was quite that early. Yeah, um, I usually wake up at five thirty, and I was like, oh, what's another hour? It can't be that hard." But that it's uh, <laughs> my brain is reacting yeah. well right now. Yeah. Okay. Well. Well. Thanks. Thanks for that and joining us. And what would you say are the key learnings? So you've been you've been running that podcast. You've been talking about these issues. What are the key takeaways um, that you've been able to that you've taken into your own life uh, to live a better life? Uh, from pursuing greatness, you mean? Yeah. From talking to all these people and from your own experience. Man. Yeah. So I. I mean, on the podcast, I always ask them, like, you know, if you could go back to yourself. Um, back to whoever your own person when you were, you know, 10, 12 years old, sit them down and give them one piece of advice. What would that piece of advice be? Um, and they all have really good answers, but I kind of, the theme that pops up in real estate, the theme that always pops up is they always say, I wish I started earlier. I wish I had started when I was, you know, in my teens, I wish I'd bought a, a, an investment property right out of college, stuff like that. Um, on the pursuing greatness side, obviously it it, it spans you know a little bit bright or broader of a of a topic range, but um, a lot of them say what do they say? Um, a lot of them say that they wish that they wouldn't be held back by fear. That they wish they would have just taken the action. They would have just you know got got into action quicker. Um, which is and it's similar to the real estate investing club, I suppose, yeah. but just more general. Um, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's pretty pertinent for anything that you want to do. Um, people are always kind of held back by what they think could happen. Um, when in reality, those, those could happens usually rarely happen. Um, and when they do, they're not that bad. So. Yeah, that is so true. And I know that you also have, do you, do you have any daily habits? Uh, cause I know that that's kind of a big thing in, um, so I'm just in, in, in curious. Yeah, yeah, daily habits. Um, I mean, I, there's a whole bunch of habits that I uh, I keep trying to make a habit that, that oh, I yeah. feel like are <laughs> are super important, like meditating, um, journaling, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The one habit that I that is a legitimate habit for me, and and uh, I feel that if I don't do it, my my life is kind of off kilter, and I'm not really you know I'm not really in the game. Um, is exercise, working out. I always get up, I work out, I run. Um, and that, I don't know, just gets me aligned with what, you know, wakes my brain up and, uh, and kind of gets me, um, woken up. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. I mean, when it comes to habits, that's the best for productivity. Still, that'd probably still be the best habit for productivity, but, um, I do. So I do the, um, morning 
or evening morning, um, I write down in the, in the evening, I'll write down the three things that I want to get done tomorrow. Uh, and then in the morning I'll review that. And, uh, and that really focuses me on what's important. And I try to get that done before 10 AM. Um, and then the rest of the day can just be, you know, I can be pulled around as always happens by all the different things that need to be addressed. Yeah, that 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 is such great advice. I'm writing a book at the moment, and <laughs> that is, I've got so much in my head and so much, but it's it is it is tough actually getting it all out. And uh, what's your uh, what's your book on? Uh, it's it's also about my sphere of real estate investing, which is called rent to rent. And so, yeah, we, we've already been teaching it. So we have uh, loads of information about it. And it's curating that into a fantastic book that's really going to deliver value. So very cool. Yeah. What is uh, what is rent to rent? I haven't heard of that one before. It's where you rent a property and then you rent, get, offer the owner a guaranteed rent and then rent it on again to tenants having done the property up a bit. So, oh, OK. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, like, yeah. do you have a word for that in America? Yeah, a lease option. Oh, although we're not buying it. So usually in a lease option, you're buying the property. Okay. So in this so one, you're just renting it. You're just leasing it. And um, so it's it's a cash flow model. Obviously, it's not a long-term investment strategy model. Huh, interesting. So you are you don't buy the property. Well, in the case of rent to rent, you don't buy the property. I actually do buy properties as well, but that's a different. It's it's a nice option for people who want to get started in investing but don't have the funds to invest yet. Oh, so they're subleasing a property exactly. that they currently. Interesting. Okay, I see what you're saying. Okay, cool. Exactly. So they're making the cash flow without buying the property, but right. for that, yeah, yeah. you've got to put in. You know, you, you put in more time and effort and energy then perhaps if you owned property and then left the management to somebody else. Right. That makes sense. Cool. Cool. Okay. Yeah, that, that is a good way to do it. If you don't have uh, if you don't have any money, that's the hard part about real estate is that like, you know, I love the business model. Each little, each property that you own is its own business and you can run it as a business. And I really love that. Um, and you can, you know, you can see the the results of your effort, especially if you're flipping a property. Yeah. But the downside is it, it's so capital intensive. Like if, you know, I, when I got started, I didn't have a ton of money. And I, you know, I, it, I had a hard time figuring out how to get into the game without without having a ton of money. And so, you know, getting over that first hurdle, getting your first rental, um, you know, starting to get the business up so you can start get, getting flips, getting uh, leads coming in. That's really hard. And so... Um, that's a good, uh, I mean, it's a good model to kind of push out there. So people who are in that situation can kind of get some, uh, you know, get, get some traction behind them. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of that, have you worked with other people's money? So do you have private investors who invest with you now? And mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about uh, how you went from, you know, not knowing how to raise money to working with um, private investors. Yeah. I mean, it's, so when I didn't know how to do it, it all seems like magic. Like I, it's like, Oh, it's so crazy. How do you get other people to invest? But it really isn't. It's just, you know, there, there are people too, and they want to make money too. And so if you, if you have a deal that'll make them money, it's, you know, it's kind of a, it sells itself. You don't really have to be, you don't have to hype yourself up about it. And so, um, you know, if somebody, if nobody, if you haven't raised money from someone before, I would say start with your family. Um, they're the best, you know, the easiest ones to go to and they're not, it's not stressful to go to them. Um, well, maybe sometimes it is, but uh, generally, you know, your family is, they understand what you're doing. They want you to win. Um, if you could show them the numbers, they, they won't be afraid of it. Um, and so I would say start with your family and then uh, from there you can expand. Um, but the, the, all you're really doing is you're just networking you're just talking to people, tell them about what you're doing. Um, and then, you know, when you get a deal, you can bring it to them say, Hey, check this out. I got this deal. Um, it's going to make you, you know, 20 IRR, um, which is internal. It's just your return on investment. Um, and they'll be like, yeah, I want to make 20% of my money for sure. I can't do that in the stock market. Um, yeah. and so it's, uh, it'll sell itself.
You can't do that many places. So um, tell us a bit about how you typically would structure a deal with a private investor. Would you, um, would it be a loan basis or would they have a share in the equity? Yeah, I mean, you can do it um, either way. Uh, if you're, if, I mean, if you just want a, a, a loan, that's a really easy way to do it um, because most people are familiar with loans. Um, and that percent in that, if you went that that direction, um, if you if you pursued that model, then they wouldn't really care about the performance of the property, and that and that wouldn't be a sell to them. Um, I feel like that if you if you know if you're trying to sell it, um, then you really want them to have some equity. But yeah, you could loan it out um, at a good interest rate and just be like, hey, you know, this isn't going to fail because I've had experience, and if you don't have experience, you can just say. <laughs> I'm not going to fail. Don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, you know, so you just, if you're going the the interest route, um, then just give them a good interest rate, something they're not, they're probably not going to get, uh, you know, elsewhere. Um, especially if they just, you know, park their money in a, in a checking account, um, give them a decent interest rate. Uh, maybe you can give them a point, um, on, on, uh, on per or on the loan. So, you know, a one, interest uh, 1% interest or 1% point. Um, so 1% of the purchase price. Um, and that's, that'll be an easy way. If you're going for people that are not family, they're going to, so private money from, you know, from a loan perspective, especially here in America is pretty damn expensive and it'll, it can break your business model a lot of times, um, depending upon, you know, what you're working with, but we're talking like 10 plus percent. Um, and that, I mean, when you're talking, you know, 300, 500 million dollars, it's gonna, it's gonna break your, break your model. You can't carry that kind of cost for, for a very long time. Um, which is why you would go the other route, which is giving them equity. And uh, that will give, they give a, get a preferred return on cash flow. And then um, they would have a piece of equity. And so you'd break it up into stocks, you know, you, you 50% of the, um, of the, the, Equity of the property is going to be given to the the um, limited partners, the people who are actually get, putting money into the property. Um, and say every ten thousand dollars, you get one percent equity. And so they give you hundred thousand dollars. Now they have ten percent of the equity of the property. They get a re preferred return um, on the cash flow that comes to the property every every month. And uh, and you know that's that's the incentive they have. Um, for one, they want the property to succeed because every month they're going to be getting checks from the property and then on the sale they're going to have that equity the 10 percent, and they'll get the um 10 return back so that sounds great and it's a it's a, it's, a, it's a great way to build up the long-term relationships uh, for the kind of uh, deals that you, that you're doing mm -hmm. um i'm curious so tell us a bit more about the real estate investing club and what are you teaching people there who is that for is it for beginners or is it for more established people yeah, so real estate investing club. Um, I didn't really start out with a, a specific goal. Um, I uh, I just wanted to you know network with other investors. I you know I I knew that it was a great way to to meet other investors, and I wanted to get out into different asset classes and understand how they were working. Um, so I started it, and uh, it goes through every different asset class. You know, um, commercial, uh, retail. Um, you know, mobile home parks, uh, residential, whatever you name, you know, whatever it is, whatever strategy you're talking about, we talk about it there. Um, but what I've noticed is that most of the people that are listening and watching are new and beginning investors, people who are really trying to get into real estate investing and they don't know how they're, you know, they're kind of trying to build a, a picture in their mind of what they should be doing. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, you know, now when I get on with guests, I'm like, Hey, when you're on this show, you're going to be talking to new and, and beginning investors. So kind of orient it that way, give them a, a framework to work with. Um, and so, yeah, so that's what we're doing. And uh, uh, we're um, education is a big, big piece of what I do. And so we're launching a um, almost free course. I'm going to put a little bit of a price on it, but nothing near what uh, other people do. Um, and that will, it'll teach people to go nuts to bolts, how to, how to get their first property in a contract and, uh, and get it closed and get that cash flow. That's fantastic. Um, what are the first steps that you think people should take? Uh, yeah. So 
I go into it in the, um, I wrote a mini book and I go into it in that. And uh, it's, it really depends on the strategy that you want. Um, mm. If you don't have any money and if you don't, it, like if you're really starting from zero, um, it is hard to get into real estate. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Uh, mm. Without, without any money, you're, it's going to be hard. Um, you, so if you, if you do go that route, the best way would probably be to wholesale. Mm. Um, which is get a contract, get a property on a contract and then assign that contract to somebody else for a fee. Um, mm. that's probably the best way to do it. If you have absolutely zero money, um, and that's just to get you going. The hard part about having no money is you're going to have a lot of stress because yeah. there, you don't have any money and you, that's all you're going to be thinking about. Um, and so you do, you need to get some kind of money coming into the door. Um, it's really difficult to think about, you know, structuring a deal. If you don't have money and you're super stressed, um, so the easiest way is just to go out there, talk to people, get something under contract, and then assign it. If you do have a little money, uh, I recommend trying to get a deal under contract that you can sell or finance. Um, mm. And this is the situation where maybe you you if you don't have great credit or you don't have the ability to close a property with a conventional loan, um, seller financing is killer. It's my favorite thing to talk about. It's uh, it's the I think it's it's best for both parties if you're the seller and if you're the buyer. Um, the seller gets more money in the long run because they have a loan. They're I mean they are the bank. Everybody wants to be the bank. That's mm -hmm. the banks are the ones that have all the money. They're the ones at the tallest buildings in every city. Mm -hmm. um, so the seller can become the bank by just seller financing their property, and it's better for you because you can negotiate terms and you can um, you don't have to go you know jump through the hoops of getting. You know, if anybody's done a conventional loan, there are a million hoops you have to jump through and you're not guaranteed in the end. Um, a lot of sellers are kind of frustrated when, you know, you you have this conventional loan and they're like, oh, God, the, the loan could fail, blah, 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 blah. So I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, seller financing. So if you're just getting started. Uh, an awesome way to go um, to go forward would be to look at FISBOs um, and try to negotiate a seller finance deal. Great. Well, I think um, just to translate, um, I think that what you're calling wholesaling is what we hear called deal sourcing in okay. the UK. And the other one that you're calling seller finance, we do sometimes call it that as well, uh, is lease options. Mm. Yeah. Um, so that's a great, a great way to get started as well. And I know that when you're training people, a, a big, a big part of it will be mindset, getting past those blocks, feeling like you can do it. Uh, do you have any uh, tips that you would give to people for how to move yourself from a position of, I can't do this to, I, okay, I can do it. I've done it. Yeah. How do you get there? Well, that's the thing is that you have to do it in order to feel confident. You're, you're going to feel that way. You're going to feel like you can't do it until you do it. And yeah. so what you have to do is to do it. And so you need to have some kind of model. You need to have some kind of step-by-step -step process that you can follow. Um, and then just follow that process every day until it works. And once it works, you're going to get, you know, your brain's going to be like, oh shit, okay, this works. I can, you know, it'll, it'll, and then you'll start to, you'll start to think creatively. You'll, you'll have a little bit more mojo. You'll be, you know, more into the process um, and you won't really need the step-by-step the -step model anymore. But until that point, you're not going to believe you can because you haven't done it yet. And uh, your brain doesn't think you can do something um, until you actually do it. And so just just follow, find a process, follow that process step by step until it works. And then once it works, uh, you're home free. That is a great tip. That I, I really love that idea because people try to go from confusion to clarity before they've done it, but you only get to clarity <laughs> when you've done the thing. Yeah. Um, so you you have to go you, you you have to go through the process as you've said and um, make yourself uh, feel fear and do it anyway. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so you've been in property and uh, real estate for a while now. What has been the best thing about it for for yourself and your family? Um, I mean, for me, it's just been time freedom. Um, when I was in when I was in corporate, my the biggest thing that I just did not like about it. Actually, there's a lot of things that I miss about corporate, and I, I'm not like trying to dog corporate here. And and if anybody's listening and they are in corporate, it's you know there are definite pros to you know, that life. And, uh, and so I'm not saying it's a bad way to go. I'm just saying, you know, it wasn't for me. And the big, the big reason why it wasn't for me is that I couldn't, you know, cr decide my own time. I couldn't create my own schedule and that, uh, frustrated me. Um, and so now I, I do create my own schedule. Um, and that is the thing that 
that is, uh, I mean, it's helped my relationships because I can be anywhere at any time, um, regardless of, you know, there's no boss. Um, and so I can do what I want, you know, to an extent, obviously I have responsibilities and I have to get those done, but, um, I do create my own schedule and, uh, and it's helped my family life. It's helped my mental life, all that stuff. So. Fantastic. And you've had time to create two podcasts, lots of books and the whole resource center over at the Real Estate Investing Club to help lots of other people get started. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show today, Gabriel. And is there anything that you feel that I haven't asked you that you'd love to be able to share? Um, no, I mean, so I mean, if people are watching and they haven't done a deal yet, um, and you guys are just you know, you're, you're trying, I'm trying to get information. You're trying to educate yourself. Um, I applaud you for educating yourself. That's obviously, you know, that's the first step, but don't get stuck in analysis paralysis. Um, don't, you know, don't stay on the sidelines for too long. Maybe, maybe read a couple of books, um, you know, watch a few podcasts, give it maybe a month, two months, and then just take action. Just go out there, get your deal done. It's not as scary as you think. Um, and just, uh, get out there and, and get her done. Yeah, and uh, check out the podcast at Real Real Estate Investing Club. And there's also a website at therealestateinvestingclub.com. So thank you so much, Gabrielle, for joining us today. And uh, thank you for watching and for listening. And I will see you all next week. Bye for now.